Uh, next for this session is my dear friend Ron Stewart uh, from Manitoba, and Ron and I go a long way back. And the topic that he's going to talk about is precipitation, which is not only a favorite of Howard and mine, but also of the GVEX community. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank Roy for that introduction to my presentation. And basically, there's a lot of people interested in water resources here, so I couldn't write the word resource, so I took the, re, the RE off. So I'll talk about the source of a lot of water, uh, which is precipitation. So I tried to follow the guidelines that were given to us uh, in terms of uh, this particular presentation. Uh, I just want to give a little bit about my background. I'm a cloud mic microphysicist. Uh, my background is all at look at the internal structure of an individual hailstone. I spent uh, many hundreds of hours flying through storms as well. And I've done a lot of work since coming back to Canada on uh, catastrophic events. Although I've been always somewhat interested in uh, drought situations. This was just taken uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> Uh, but for this particular presentation, I've sort of morphed into somebody who looks at some branches of the, the water cycle. And for most of you here, uh, the water cycle sort of starts down here, but you do need a few people who are asking the question, well, how does the precipitation actually get down? And of course, Roy just gave a, a fantastic presentation on the state of the art of some of the modeling capabilities to do that. But basically, the kinds of questions that we've been asked, basically, is to talk about the improvements in scientific understanding and tools that have been developed over the last few decades. And basically, first of all, so what are the key issues with climate? Well, if you're looking at precipitation, it's not hard to fill up a whole page about a lot of precipitation anomalies. So as an atmospheric scientist, we're really interested in the factors that lead to any and each one of these particular key functions. So in terms of key improvements in understanding over the last few decades, I think I can break them down into about three different categories. One of them is we've made enormous uh, improvements in measuring and actually analyzing precipitation-related parameters. Uh, that in itself is really important. So we're not just interested in how much precipitation actually occurred, we're interested in the size distribution of it, for example. And we're not just interested at the precipitate ground, we're interested in the vertical profiles of how it actually got there as well. And there's been vast improvements in each one of those areas. And furthermore, we've made enormous increases in our understanding of precipitation production, and then the factors that conspire, as Roy just mentioned, on occasion to produce extremes. And furthermore, this has been culminating in these uh, cloud model advances, such again, you've just seen. In terms of some of the, the first ones in measurement, <clears throat> the key thing is quantification. Uh, several decades ago, uh, basically the idea of quantifying was relatively novel uh, concept. Uh, we talked a lot about things and we had to use our hands as I'm doing now, which is much more reckless abandon. And a huge advance was made in digitization Something as simple as a digital camera made us, has made an enormous difference in precipitation. So we can now take pictures with three cameras of actually falling precipitation, such as you see. We can replicate uh, many, many images, which you couldn't do decades ago. Uh, we see many examples of the huge increase in remote sensing and portable systems. So there's now a, a gaggle of small little radars situated over top of precipitation sites, giving us information on the, the evolution of precip down to your gauge. And we've already seen many examples of the increase of computational capabilities. I tell my students I had to carry around all these little cards, right? They just can't even imagine having these little uh, Fortran cards uh, nowadays, but that's been a huge advance. <coughs> Several decades ago, this conceptual picture of precipitation production was, to a certain extent, so, uh, still somewhat filled in, but there's been obviously major progress in actually quantifying that. You have to take your water source, as we just saw from Roy, and follow through these many different chains of events 
to occasionally produce precipitation. And in fact, it's not surprising, precipitation itself is extreme. I mean, what molecule of water wants to go through all these processes just to land on the ground? <laughs> and each one of these is a whole field in their own right. Uh, here's this coalescence. It's just one word in that particular diagram, but it's a very complicated process. You have, in that particular case, you have two drops which are both falling, and the issue is whether they're going to collide or go around each other. And even if they collide, what is going to be the outcome? There are numerous outcomes of that. So there's a whole field of literature just based on that one little word, and that one little word is actually interacting with this whole mass in here as well. And very often, you don't just have branches on the right-hand side of liquid and the middle side of solid. They're actually work together, or they have to work together. So it's very complicated, and Roy just quickly went over that in talking about the microphysical parameterization. But we've made enormous advances in capturing much of this in models such as Roy talked about. I may add, when I was uh, younger, uh, the word of aerosols was just something that was magically there. There was always enough aerosols to initiate a droplet or an ice crystal. But we've made a huge progress in that, there was even a growing awareness of the importance of organic material in initiating some of these droplets. So there's been an enormous increase in the understanding. <coughs> and as the interesting thing is still very encouraging that we can write an article just uh, two years ago that actually came up with a conceptual picture of something as simple as winter precipitation. And the interesting thing is in 2018, there's some particles on here which fall all the time, but we don't have a name for them. Uh, liquid core pellet, for example, is a very common thing which happens. It's not always an ice pellet solid, solid, it actually has liquid within it. That's very common, but there's no official name for that anywhere. So I find that actually kind of gratifying in 2018. We're subjected to particles of which there actually is no name. So a lot of this has culminated together in the ability to run high resolution models such as just Roy just talked about not just to replicate an event, but actually to work on it for decadal time periods. This is a, a true uh, fantastic progress. <clears throat> I may add, I think you need that kind of resolution, not necessarily just for MCSs. When we have a drought over uh, Western Canada, it's not uncommon for the number of clouds to be exactly the same as normal. The interesting issue is whether those clouds are going to produce precipitation. So, for example, in 2002 in Edmonton, the summer precip was only half of normal. But interestingly enough, the amount of virga, which is precipitation trying but not quite reaching the ground, was the same number of hours as precipitation. You really need a high-resolution model to be able to simulate virga and not precip. And small showers at the right time of the year are really critical. So what I would argue for certain aspects of even something like drought, I think, high resolution models to capture the microphysics is really very important. So what are the grand scientific challenges that impede progress? Well basically from perspective of myself that I'm always very interested in extremes and not only that two aspects of that how can we see ch uh, extremes change on longer time frames but on the very short prediction weather prediction time scale it's also a really important issue. At those smaller scales, you have to understand fine scale, spatial, and temporal scales. So these are ongoing issues. And I may say there's certainly a lot of scientific challenges coming from a place like Canada. We're always limited by the lack of surface and atmospheric observing systems that we can sustain that are well calibrated. And furthermore, it's always been very frustrating to be able to look at surface precipitation and if your model says it's right, you say, well, that we must be really good, but you don't know whether you've actually got it right for the wrong reasons. And if you don't get it right, you don't know why. So I think there's a really important challenge we have to overcome, and technology should allow us to do this, to not just look at precip at the ground, to look at the vertical profile down to that. And a big issue we have in Canada, when we have an extreme event, a bunch of us will get together and try to pull various data sets together to properly look at that particular event. But this can actually take us years to do this. The various different data sets and merging them and things like that. It's an extremely inefficient process. 
I look with envy to my American colleagues who are much better at that than we are, but I know in Canada that is an enormous limitation to our capabilities. There's certainly some supporting scientific issues of that. We've made enormous progress in precipitation, as I said. The key thing is to get a lot of the rates of processes correct, because many things happen very quickly in the atmosphere. And furthermore, a lot of the precipitation is linked with phase changes between the liquid and the solid. And these, in fact, affect the environment within which the precipitation is forming through thermodynamic and dynamic consequences. You have to get them all right, which is a very tricky thing to do. And furthermore, we have to get better at understanding the role of the surface on the precipitation through moisture fluxes, for example, and vice versa. And we have to be very good at accounting for embedded storm features. <coughs> We had a major flooding event in Alberta in 2013. This is an example of radar imagery. So whenever you had a very uh, a core of precipitation passing over a site, there was a quantum leap in the amount of precipitation, these very narrow filaments of convective precipitation coming down. So in order to understand precipitate the ground, you have to understand that. And that's in some ways linked in with topographic forcing as well. So what might we collectively, collectively do to support society? <clears throat> well, again, I'm just reiterating the uh, extremes aspects of these and looking at some experience we've had over the prairies. Shortages and excesses are a major issue. This is an example of precipitation distribution in a whole month of May just a couple of years ago. And we actually had sustained for several weeks this incredible uh, bipole nature of the precipitation from extremely dry uh, to extremely wet at the very same time. At the north, it was actually catastrophic fires. At the south, it was catastrophic flooding. A place like Manitoba, we basically were fighting forest fires and flooding at exactly the same time. And so basically understanding whether we can better predict these uh, is really an important issue. And a, and a Canadian problem we have as well is the phase changes. As we have a warmer climate, more of our precept will fall as snow versus rain. And in fact, some of that snow will actually fall as freezing rain, which actually is a major hazard for many parts of the country. So small changes in phase can also have big impacts. So what can we collectively do? Uh, and now we're talking about several decades down the road. I, I can't imagine that with all the smartphones and everything like that, there's not going to be a huge increase in data. Even just knowing the occurrence of precipitation, there may be a huge uh, increase in the amount of information characterizing at least some aspects of precipitation. And as we, our surfaces are being altered through climate change, what is going to be the consequence of that? And as numerous other people have pointed out, we need to better point out our insights and our shortcomings. I really enjoy chatting with the general public, for example, about how well we're doing and how, what shortcomings we have. And they really appreciate taking the time to actually go through uh, the caveats we as scientists actually know about. And I'm not sure if we have a lot of dire consequences in the next several decades what exactly is going to be asked of us of the water cycle community in terms of potentially trying to alter that. So in conclusion, precipitation has been, is, and I'm pretty sure still will be a critical issue. We've made enormous strides in all aspects related to precipitation. I think with issues of climate change, increasing population, a more globally connected economy, there's even a greater urgency to look at these particular issues. So when we meet in 40 more years, I just not sure we should have an atmospheric uh, subcomponent here. I think I'm hoping we can have a whole discussion on the complete flow of water, uh, not just at the surface, but through the atmospheric system as well. And just uh, just like thank Howard very much, and I just like to offer the the pleasant uh, picturesque prairies as just to remember remember us by. Thank you very much.